So the question I want to ask you today to start is, what's a picture book? <laughs> yes, Aisha. A book with pictures. That is mostly, almost always true. Me. Um, if we're just asking that question, we're going to get a of our life or <laughs> That's true. It is an experience, often featuring, but not always featuring, story told through words and pictures. I think that's a, it is an experience, often told through story and picture. I think that's a really good one. I'm honestly not sure anyone can come up with a comprehensive answer to this question using like what we think of as literary language, which is evidenced by what people just said, right? Because the very best thing about picture books, in my estimation, is that they can do almost anything. They can be stories, but they don't have to be. They can also be lists or puzzles or maps or recipes. There are no rules beyond the rule that you need to engage the kid who will encounter it. So for the purposes of this lecture and ideally moving forward, I'd like for all of us to expand the way we think about picture books. I'd like for everyone to think of picture books not as a story, but as a box. Um, and so then my next term is box. What's a box? Who knows what a box is? Something you put stuff in. That's exactly right. Aaron gets it. It's gold star. <laughs> a box is a place to store things. You can store anything in a box. In fact, you can store disparate things that don't actually go together in a box, and the box will connect them. It just all has to be put in the box correctly. It all has to fit together, right? You wouldn't pour a gallon of gasoline in the box with a live goldfish and a handful of gummy bears. The end result would be awful. But there might be a way that all those things could go into the box together. The task would be arranging them artfully and thoughtfully. Picture books are a lot like that. Often when we talk about picture books, we import boundaries, rules, and standards from the way we talk about fiction. This is something I'm increasingly bothered by, <laughs> I, for myself as a writer, not, not like, for, yeah. I find it limiting to picture book craft. And some of you will remember my character lecture about how not to write a fully developed character or the setting lecture last semester when I wanted you to think about the book like a stage. That said, the craft of fiction tends to be our common language. And so we use words like character and setting when we talk about picture books. But there are other languages at our disposal. You may not all know this, but I've never taken a fiction class in my life. So when you're circling people, you're like, oh, I don't know, Laurel doesn't have fiction. I'm basically a fraud. When I came, when I came to Hamlin six years ago, I spent the resident, my first residency scribbling notes from all the other faculty members. In particular, I remember Swathi saying the word psychic distance, and I was like, what? What's that? Like, I just had no idea what I was doing. Um, because my MFA all those years ago was in poetry. So I'm not going to give you a lecture about poetry today, although sometimes I do that, but I want to use it to illustrate something. I want you to look at this. Most, if not all of you know this poem, right? So now that I chose a poem that I hope is sort of a common language. Now I want you to tell me, what's the plot here? What's the main character? What's the theme? You know how the language of fiction doesn't work when we try to talk about Williams? We're still going to use it because it's the language we have. But as I proceed with this lecture, and in any conversations you might have about picture books, I want you to begin by trying hard to get away from your assumptions. Rather than seeing a picture book as a story, I want you to stop and see it as a box. I want you to think about this poem and the fact that people love this poem. This is an incredibly famous poem. People teach this poem all the time, but they don't have any of those elements, right? In, in the traditional sense. When you write, when you read, when you workshop, ask what sort of a box you're looking at. Is it a puzzle box? Is it a poem box? Is it a list box? Is it a box shaped like a set of instructions? A joke box? Does that make sense? Does that make sense so far? Like, all right. Okay, so now that we all know what a picture book is or isn't, we're going to move on to what theme is or isn't and ask how that term applies or doesn't to a box. Of the craft elements we focus on in this program, I find theme to be the one students struggle with the most. It's the slipperiest, the squishiest, the hardest to pin down. As we've heard in past residencies, theme, which can be elusive, is understood as aboutness. It's the point of the story when we have a story, and it can lurk in every corner of a novel. Turning to Burroway, we find this line. 
A story may be about a dying samurai or a quarreling couple or two kids on a trampoline, and those would not be the themes of those stories. A story is also about an abstraction. And for those of you who are new to the program, Burroway, Janet Burroway is the, one of the craft texts that we use, and we used to use it really as our core central text, and now I think it's, it's, we're treated a little differently, but she can be very useful. I think that's exactly right. In a novel, theme is an abstraction, which is maybe why it's so hard to explain and teach. Theme is the soul of the story, maybe. Theme is what matters, or it's what makes a story feel significant. Theme is the layer of meaning. To put it another way, Grace Paley said, um, and this is from an interview that uh, Anne Hood did, oh, which I left off the last name. And that's Anne Hood talking about something Grace Paley said. Every story is two stories, the one on the surface and the one bubbling beneath. The climax is when they collide. It's the place they, I wouldn't say collide, I would say intersect. The place where you realize the sort of theme comes into the story. I think that's true. So again, we aren't writing a story, we're building a box, right? So while Paley and Burroway might work for us, they might not, depending on what we're doing. In box building, theme doesn't have to be theme with a capital T. Theme doesn't have to be a big abstraction like death or love, or faith or hope. Themes can be pulled out of the story by small gestures, sounds, repetitions, images, all sorts of things. In the same way that small gestures in our actual lives can deepen the world around us, Themes can be granular, but they alter the story and add complexity and depth. Like a white chicken or rainwater might do, for instance, or the surprising use of a verb like depends, right? A poem is this like carefully constructed little machine and any piece you take away is gonna change that poem, but none of those things is like the underline in the poem, right? They just sort of work together. Personally, when I work on long fiction, I like to theme of theme, think of theme as undercurrent all the things happening below the surface of the story. Theme runs beneath all the other elements in a novel and in a way connects them to each other. It gives everything a reason to be there. When I were so right, so if you're thinking about theme and often what happens when you're writing something longer is you don't know your theme when you start. At some point in the process of writing or revising, the theme sort of, it's like groundwater. It sort of rises the story, into the story and you go, oh, 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 I know what this is about. And then you start to pull that scene out of all these other details and characters and moments in the story. And you start to, it's like a constellation. You sort of start to see like, oh, this is now a book about death. So the image of the bird falling in the sky or the ant that you stepped on, suddenly those moments in the story become part of the theme and you begin to connect them, right? In separate passes, I try to make sure each theme I've tried to explore is present in the setting, in each character, in key plot points, in tiny ways, those small gestures to which I just referred. I might add a layer to a book in which tangible things are often unfolding or opening as a mirror for what's happening within a character's internal development. I might see the story with small lies and inaccuracies as a way of drawing the reader's attention to the absence of truth. I might create a setting that functions as objective correlative for the emotional themes in the story. There is no element in the story where you can't employ the development of theme. Every other aspect of the story can contribute to the theme. So for instance, in Orphan Island, I did a pass to see how all the moments in the book interacted with the idea of individuality versus community, where I just read through my book looking for places that might connect to that larger idea. I did a pass that considered how every moment in the story spoke to the idea of departure. I did a pass that considered the line between caretaking and overprotection and one that was about how faith can breed action. When I work on long fiction, themes sort of rise up as I draft and I note them. And then I want to be sure I read the book carefully many times so that the way I engage with theme feels continuous and aligned. I might also remove a theme if it feels like a book is becoming too heavy or precious or just too complicated. In a case like that, I do another pass and I pull out all the stitches that connect each of the book's elements to that theme. And that's fine because most of the books we love have many themes, right? But you can cram them too full. In my most recent novel, The Witch of Woodland, I spent two year, two drafts carefully developing the theme of centeredness. I wanted Zippy, my main character, to learn slowly that she was not, she was only the main character in her own story, and that everyone else was living a different story, in which they were the main character. But the book couldn't carry that extra weight, and I had to scrap the whole thing and like go through and pull all of that up. As I said earlier, I'm not here today to talk about novels. I'm here to talk about picture books. And in picture books, theme can operate very differently from all of that. 
In writing fiction, Burroway also turns to John Gardner for help in explaining theme. And he says pretty much what you'd expect him to say. The theme is not imposed on the story, but evoked from within it and a bunch of other stuff, which I obviously agree with. But then he says this about the writer. Only when he thinks about a story in this way does he approve the writer. Does he approve not just an alternative reality or loosely an imitation of nature, but true firm art, fiction as serious thought. Now, I personally think this is kind of a ridiculous statement. <laughs> My students can attest that I generally try to steer away from words like only, never, and always. But while Gardner's statement may often be true for literary fiction, it doesn't work for picture books at all. I don't know what true firm art is or fiction as serious thought, but picture books don't have to do that work. They can, but they definitely don't need to, and most of the time they don't, right? So like, for instance, this book, these guys went on Collicott for, for the companion to this book. This is not like serious whatever, you know? Um, what's it for if we aren't making fiction as serious thought? How can we talk about it in a way that will be useful to all of us? And if a picture book doesn't incorporate theme in this way, what does it do instead? So that's sort of where I'm beginning my process. In uh, our picture book craft text, Anne Whitford Paul says of theme, enduring picture books must be about something bigger than a mere incident. The story problem must explore some large theme or issue. It must have a kernel of truth about life and our world. But the truth is that I don't think she's fudging here, trying to get picture books to conform to our expectations of fiction. Probably she's read her John Gardner. In fact, I don't think a kernel of truth is what we mean when we say theme. Though I do think that a kernel of truth is much closer to what we're looking for when we write a picture book. That kernel of truth is instead of theme much of the time. Before I continue, I should of course say that picture books can have themes. We often point to send up for this, right? What is the theme of where the wild things are? Anyone? The night Max wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind and another, his mother called him wild thing, and Max said, I'll eat you up. So he was sent to bed without eating anything. That very night in Max's room, a forest grew and grew and grew until his ceiling hung with vines and the walls became the world all around and an ocean tumbled by with a private boat for Max and he sailed off through night and day and in and out of weeks and almost over a year to where the wild things are. Anybody want to say what they think this book is about, Alana? Monstrous, you're deserving of love. Even when you're monstrous, you're deserving of love. I think that's great. Anyone else? Dashka. Self-mastery. Self I want to lecture on that. People typically suggest that this is a book about imagination and power that kids like Max struggle to behave or control themselves and so escape to the world inside themselves where they can let loose and maybe control the world. In the form of the wild things, Max tames and controls the very impulses that sent him away in the first place. So that's sort of like what Vodashka is saying. So then he can return home, right? People also say that the theme of this book is actually safety and security because of the last line, and it was still hot, right? He goes away, he does all these things, and then he comes home and the world is still there intact for him. I think both of those assessments are accurate. This is at once a book about a boy who runs away, and also a book about a boy who comes home to discover he was loved all along. It's about insides and outsides, the things we can control and the things we can't. It's about devouring and refusing to be devoured. In fact, I find it interesting how often the theme or the message of a picture book can be altered by the last line in this way, as what I might call a coda of reassurance. If Max doesn't find his supper waiting for him still hot, he's on his own in the world. It's the hot supper that adds the layer of safety and maternal care. What it means for Max to run off on his adventure is different if he comes home and feels cared for, forgiven, right? And so the final theme is one of comfort, unconditional love. But we can imagine a story that ends very differently. Right? If, you, if you were to change the last line of that book, the theme of the book changes completely. 